book of Habakkuk. If you remember, that's just a, probably a few pages uh, backwards from Matthew. After Nahum and before Zephaniah. The book of Habakkuk. Now, as we have been looking at Habakkuk a couple, about a month or so ago, we looked at Habakkuk's first question. And uh, just by way of review, we remember that Habakkuk was looking at the nation of Israel and he's looking at all the evil that was going on. And all the way that evil was just seemed to be triumphing over all the good. How evil men seemed to be just surrounding those that were righteous and, uh, and how it seemed like everything was uh, just, just wrong. And he, he saw how uh, the right seemed to be in such a minority. And he was just talking to God, and he said, you know, how, how can you let this continue? And, uh, and God said he wouldn't. He wasn't going to let it continue. And do you remember what, uh, what God said was going to happen? God said he had a judgment in the, in, in the plans. And it's the Chaldeans. And they were going to come. And he described them. And these are a mean people. In fact, if you, if you look at some of that, um, the description of them, verse 7 of Habakkuk. They are, a terrible and dread, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves. And their horsemen shall come from the far. And they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at kings, and princes shall be a scorn to them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this, his power unto his God. So he's describing the Chaldeans, and even what's going to happen to them after they've kind of amassed all this power, that, they are going, that he shall pass over and offend, speaking, I believe, of God, and seeing that, you know, basically claiming that his God enabled him to do all these things. But so Babylon was going to come and be used by God to judge his own people, Israel. Now, we talked about how sometimes as uh, believers, we start looking around and go, you know, how can you let all this evil around us go on? And we sometimes forget that God will judge every, God will judge every sin. Every sin that is committed will be judged. Thankfully, if you're a believer, Jesus has taken the, taken the price of that judgment on himself. But every sin will be judged and paid for. But as we look at this, there's a question that comes up. A follow-up question, and it's something that it was very natural for Christians to think. And so I think it's very fitting that we see it here in Scripture. And uh, so we want to look at this second question that Habakkuk had, and that starts in verse 12 and goes down to verse 1 of chapter 2. And we're going to also look at the beginning of God's answer to that question. So let's look at Habakkuk 1, verse 12, and we're going to read down to verse Five. Habakkuk 1 verse 12. It says this. Here's Habakkuk speaking. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Question mark. And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that are no ruler over them. They shall take up all of them with the angle. They shall catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. 
Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me, speaking of God, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And here's the Lord's answer. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, such as death, as it is, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. And it goes on to describe some of the judgments that are going to come upon these people. But tonight I really wanted to focus on Habakkuk's question and some of the things that we see in there, as well as the beginning of God's answer. So let's, let's take a look at that. First of all, what Habakkuk's second question was. Now when you think about what God had said, here's God's people, the children of Israel, who were disobeying. Many of them were disobeying, but there were the remnant of those like Habakkuk who wanted to obey God. And God says, okay, this is what I'm going to do in order to correct these people who are doing wrong in Israel, which were many of these people. I'm going to cause this nation, which may not even at that, this time, at this point yet, even been any kind of a real power. They may have been still a vassal of the Assyrian uh, Empire. I'm going to cause them to come and basically just swallow you guys up. Now, if you think about this, 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 is, this is the question he has. Well, in fact, let's, 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 put it, let's put it in some modern day times. For example, say you were, you were living in a, in a, in a neighborhood that had, had a lot of crime going on. And you went to the police and said, you know, can you do anything about this? Look, there's all kinds of evil things going on. Can you do anything about it? And the police said, yes, we're going to do something about it. We have a squad of people that we're just getting ready to release from prison, and we're going to send them in, and they're going to rampage through your community. And they're going to judge all those people. What would your thought be? Would you have some concerns about that? Like, I'm there. Can't you just, like, arrest the bad people? Can't you just take care of those? And this is kind of a little bit what Habakkuk's question was. He's like, wow, you're not just going to take care of them. You're going you're to judge all of this nation. And so let's look at a little bit more detail what he's saying. First of all, he's, he, his question is something like this. Can, jo can God, being just, Allow someone who is evil to punish someone who is more righteous. Sometimes with us as Christians, we start thinking that way. We, we start thinking about, you know, um, you know, how can God let the government strip away our freedoms as Christians? You know, how can God let evil men be elected into office of this country that was once claimed to be a Christian nation? You know, how, how, can, how can it be part of God's plan for these things to happen? And I've heard, I've heard that enunciated in different ways. You know, you know how, can, how on earth can, can somebody like that be in office? Whether it be someone who's just re really doing all kinds of evil things in our local government or in national government. And uh, so this is the question that he asked, first of all, in 13b. And this is probably the most striking way he puts it. Uh, look at Habakkuk uh, 1, 13b. It says, he puts it this way. Wherefore, lookest upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour that man that is more righteous than he. Doesn't there seem to be something a little bit different 
when God allows someone who's really nasty to come and deal with someone who is sinful, but maybe not quite as bad off as that person is. That's kind of like having a, a petty thief, you know, get, you know, maybe a home invasion comes to his house. You know, so, some, someone comes in and, and invades his house and ties him up and, you know, wait, you know, what's the, is there, is there justice in that? And God certainly is, is about to talk to him about that. Now let's look at the next question he has. Um, verse 14, he asks this, And makest men as the fishes of the sea, and as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. Here's another question. He's saying, will you make all men almost like animals? Is this the way human events is supposed to go, that basically there's just no no order and someone can co just come in and just swallow up all these nations like there's no leader or any any leadership in fact he's really I think thinking about God and his leadership you know I, I does this just happen without any really anybody overseeing all this in verse 15 and 16 he's asked this and, and look at the way he puts it they take up all of them with the angle they catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. So he's talking about all the nations and all the people of the earth being as fish in the sea. And here the Babylonians are coming and they've got fishing lines in the sea and nets and they're just gathering up all these people just like they're fish. And they're dumping them out on the land and then gathering up more. And because their nets, you know, and I think he's kind of picturing their instruments of war, because their nets are bringing them all these fish, once they get done catching these fish or these people or these nations, they bow down to their nets and worship them. This was sort of what Babylon did, really. I mean, what happened? They became all full of themselves and believed that their horses and their armies uh, would protect them and they started worshiping the power that they had in themselves. And so here Habakkuk saying you're going to use these people who are so idolatrous they start worshiping their own implements of war because you know that's what brings them all this all this bounty so his, his next question is can you see their proud idolatry and then in verse 17 he says shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations if you think about the context for this here you had the Assyrians and God was saying these Babylonians are going to come and gobble up the Assyrians and all these other nations including Israel At this point in history, the Babylonians would basically overtake every pit, bit of the known world that people here in Israel at least would know about. And the assumption, you know, from that point in history, you look at that and you're going, wow, they're just going to rule everything. And you can't see any, any way that anything would ever even overtake that. They're just going to do this forever? So Habakkuk's asking that, will you allow this to go on forever? And basically he's saying, how can this be? Now notice a couple of things about his question that, uh, that I think are important. First of all, he does know God. His questions come out of what he knows about God. Look, look at verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? So he's talking about his eternality. He's talking about the fact that God is holy. He says, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. He knows that they are, God is using them to correct. But he's just wondering how that works in God's character. He also knows that God is a wise God. That He, he knows that he is just and he comes to God with these questions. Can God being just allow someone evil to punish someone who is more righteous? 
Will he leave all men and nations without a leader or protection? Can you see their proud idolatry? Will you allow this to go on forever? It's interesting that we often have these same kinds of questions. For example, that first question about how can God let someone more evil judge someone who's maybe not as evil as them? You know, how can God let his people be judged by people who are worldly and vicious and evil and horrible, way worse than they are? And one of the questions that brings up is, whose sin or what sin do you suppose God cares about more about dealing with in a timely manner? What sin, whose sin does God really want to correct or deal with in a more timely manner? Those who are his children or those who are in the world? Now, God will deal with all of that. But who do you think God starts with when he's dealing with sin? Now, there's some, some passages that, that might um, bear some light on that. We've been in 1 Peter, and there's a place where it says, For the time has come, in, come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it for, first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? That sort of points to the fact that God does point first of all at his own people. But I think one of the, one of the things that uh, is going on here is that Christians sometimes like to compare. We like to look at the world, and then we start to compare ourselves to that, and we go, oh, they are so wicked. But at the same time, we're looking at the world and judging them for their wickedness. We're also by that same thing, by looking at the world and comparing ourselves by them, we start to make ourselves look better in our own eyes. In fact, a lot of Christians like to look at the world because it makes them feel a whole lot better. I heard one person say, we like to pick friends sometimes even that are worse off than our, some people like to pick, pick friends that are worse, worse than themselves just because they can be the, the good one of the group. Some people do it that way. But even if it's, that's not going on, it's dangerous for us to compare ourselves with the world. So many things that we allow as believers in our own lives are things that we don't need. We accept just as, it's like the air we breathe. Because we look at the world and we sort of start to accept things in the world. You know, it's easy to be self-righteous when you're with the world. It's easy for us to make ourselves look better. It boosts our pride. And yet this approach, when we look at the world and compare ourselves to the world, it's bankrupt. What we really need to be doing is comparing ourselves to God, what God says and who God is. And then we'll have a clear picture of what is real and what is right. And so we need to be looking at ourselves in comparison with God rather than with the world. And God is not afraid to deal even with believers in their lives even through different means, to bring them uh, back to him. Now in verse, and we're going to look, we're going to skip just a verse, the first verse in chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to come back to that. But I want to look a little bit at God's, the beginning of God's answer. We're going to look more at that next time because there's five things, five woes that God pronounces on the Babylonians. And there's five ways he's going to judge them, and there's five specific things that he's going to judge them for. And we're, we're going to hold that for the next time we get together. But I want to show you the beginning of God's answer. He starts out by saying, write down the answer to your question. In verse 2, it says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Okay. This is... He says, write this down, and the idea is that one, once it's written down, send it out with a runner to share it with others, okay, with a courier. So he's going to write it down on these tables, you know, it, it very well may have been tables, it may have been, you know, some, some kind of a hard surface that he's writing this down on. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to think, as you read that, we kind of like think of that in sort of abstraction, 
But that's really how we got this book. It was written down. And so he's telling, he's telling, God's telling him, write this down. I want this to be part of what is, is uh, recorded for us. And he says that this answer will come in time. Look, look at what it says. It's interesting. Um, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The idea is that God, when he deals with things, he deals with things in his own timing. I don't know about you, but in my own heart, I see something that needs to be dealt with, and I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, let's, let's go help God deal with this thing. You know, sometimes in, in your children's, you know, lives, different things, we're, we're so ready to just try and fix it. And God says, I work on things in my own timing. I can remember um, a family member who we'd been praying for for a long time. And I remember seeing different things going on in their life. And, you know, you see, man, this thing just totally fell apart for them. And you're thinking, wow, this is God's judgment. This is God's chasing. They're going to turn around. Now, you know, they've kind of like reached the end of their rope. Uh, you know, we believe that they're a, uh, they're a believer. And, you know, they're, they're, but they're backslidden. And the Lord, Lord's using this to turn them around. And it wasn't. And they just kept on going on. And you're like, wow, you know, how, how, how'd they miss that? And you see another situation come up. And, and you're like, wow, just like lost his car and, you know, is injured. And, okay, the Lord's, I know the Lord's going to work through this to bring them back to him. And all kinds of things were going on in this person's life. And finally, I couldn't even tell what was going on. But all of a sudden, this person starts turning around and the Lord start working in their heart in just little ways. And I'm thinking, wow, it wasn't this and it wasn't this and it wasn't this and it wasn't this. And all of a sudden, the Lord was starting to bring them back to him. And it was exciting to see. But in my timing, I was like, oh, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. And we sometimes do that in our own lives, whether it's seeing other believers, some of these people that we're praying for, that the Lord will, will work in their heart and bring them back from backslidden condition. The Lord has his time, and we need to pray that his time would work. But we also need to wait for that and allow that to happen. So many times our, in our own impatience, we think that God is not answering our prayers, and he may be working and preparing the, the place, but it, it's in his time. Look, I mean, God himself is just saying, but at the end it shall speak. Okay, it is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And I think the idea there is it will not tarry forever. That time will come. And so he's saying this time will come. Now he also makes a statement here in the next verse, which is a pretty exciting thing to see. I mean, you're, you're looking at this and you're not expecting to see this. But in verse, soul, in verse 4, he says this, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Does that sound familiar to you? The just shall live by his faith? Have you heard that anywhere else? It's interesting, in this passage where it's talking about judging the Babylonians, and he's talking about how he's haughty and, and, and just uh, proud, and, you know, the Bible says that God hates pride. He resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Here in this passage, you see kind of a parallel to that. Let me read it again. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, that's the idea of being proud, is not upright in him, is not right with the Lord in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So he's saying proud men are wrong, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, we, this, this very passage is quoted at least three times in the New Testament. And when it's quoted in the New Testament, it has gospel implications. Let's look at the first one, Romans 1.17. Do you mind turning to Romans 1.17? Here in this book of uh, Habakkuk, it's talking about judging the Babylonians. 
we see glimpses of the gospel that's going to come. Romans 1.17. I'm going to go back to verse 16. It says this, Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Here in the midst of a passage where God is talking about how sin and degradation go deeper and deeper and deeper. He also contrasts that with the fact that the just shall live by faith. Let's look at another passage, Galatians 3.11. And, and if you notice in the last one, he actually quote, he says, as it is written, He's talking about Habakkuk. Ver Galatians 3.11 says this, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For, which is kind of like saying for it's written, the just shall live by faith. Here, how does that connect with what we just read in Habakkuk. It talks about the pride of the Babylonians and it talks about the just living by faith. There's almost an opposite thing going on here. You see the Babylonians in their pride and you see the just living by their faith. There really is something opposite going on. Men in pride do not turn to the Savior. Only people who are humble or humbled by God turn to the Savior. When you think that you can deal with everything, when you think you've got everything covered, we don't, you don't run to the Lord. But when you know who you are before the Lord, when you realize that you have nothing and are humble in that way, you turn to the Lord. When you were saved, one of the things that really had to go on is that you realized that you were a sinner without any hope of paying for your own sins. If there's anything, if there's anything that's important for a person to actually believe and be saved, it's the fact that they know that they can't save themselves. They know that they're lost in their sin. You don't get saved if you're not lost. And so here's the, the just juxtaposition that's being placed in these passages as well in, as in Habakkuk. And there's one more in Hebrews 10.38. Hebrews 10.38, it's also quoted. says this, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in them. He also is taught, this is in the, uh, in the uh, context of that for yet a little while, verse 7, and he that will, shall come will come and will not tarry. The idea is that Christ is coming and those that live by faith will be the ones that he comes for. It's a wonderful thing that in a passage where it's talking about this judgment, you see glimpses of even the gospel, that it's the just living by faith, not in themselves, but in, in God, to carry them through all these things. And then he goes on and gives five different woes, which we're going to look at. But I want to pull us back to Habakkuk 2.1. So let's look at Habakkuk 2.1. As you look at this and you think about this, there's something pretty amazing going on. Habakkuk does know how, he does know what God is like, more than most of us probably do. His very good sense of it, he's talked with the Lord. 
can you imagine actually like questioning God the way he does? Out loud. I mean, God's talking to you, telling you all these things, and he's having a pretty serious conversation. He's questioning God about, you know, how can you do this, God? And I think we can learn a lot from Habakkuk's attitude in verse 1 of chapter 2. Look at how he ends this up. He has these questions, and they're real questions. But he ends up this way, and he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I think one of the reasons Habakkuk was able to have this kind of a conversation with God is because he really truthfully wanted the answer and he believed God would give it to him and he was willing to listen to whatever God's answer was. One of, the one of the commentaries on Habakkuk calls what was going on here a man who wrestled with God. And this is a lot what was going on. Habakkuk was talking with God about this judgment that at this point was inevitable. God didn't put any more ifs. If you don't do this, this is going to happen. He said, this is happening. The, you know, the, the children of Israel had already turned away. You know, there was no more questions about it was, if it was happening. He said, this is happening. And how Habakkuk was able to wrestle with God in prayer. And so the thing that, that I, I think really stuck out to me about Habakkuk and the way he asked these questions is that he asked them with real knowledge about who God was. He was interacting with who God was and the circumstances around him. And he was asking God, how can this work out the way that it is? Knowing who you are, how can this happen? And he wanted to hear God's answer. And God does answer him here in this book. And we're going to see more of that as we go on. But let me ask you this. Is that the way that you go? When you have questions for God, do we go this way? Do we ask those questions and then say, Lord, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to set me upon stand upon my watch and set me upon a tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me, what I shall answer and what I am reproved. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to be patient and wait to see what you're going to show us. I'm going to look at my Bible. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to keep on going to church. I'm going to keep on living for you. And I'm going to wait and see what answers you have. I'm going to let you work out your plan and trust that you're going to probably show me a lot of things that I don't get right now. In fact, the word, look at the word he says at the end, when I am reproved. He really believed that though he couldn't figure it out, God was going to straighten his thinking out. God was going to straighten him out and say, here's what was going on. And he knew that God was going to help him figure that out and also correct him at the same time. Is that the way that we go to prayer a lot of times? When we have something that just disturbs us. Look at, look at our country. How, how can these things be? Look at the way Christians are being persecuted around the world. Look at how evil just seems to be triumphing on every, every part. God, how can this be? And then we stop and we say, I'm looking forward to seeing what, you, what you're going to show me. I'm going to listen. I'm going to let you correct me. I'm going to let you reprove me. Are we willing to come in that kind of an attitude? Do you have as much faith in God as Habakkuk did that you're both drawn not to avoid those difficult questions but ask those questions but also be willing to wait for the answer? You know, it's not faith. So many times in our lives, I, I've seen it in myself, we see something that just doesn't make sense and we don't even want to think about it. We kind of want to avoid that question. Oh. And God wants us to know who he is, to interpret things in the light of his character, and even ask those hard questions. It took more faith for him to ask these hard questions than it does for us sometimes to just go, oh, well, whatever, I, I don't know. How many times do we do that? We, we just kind of see things that are going on. We, we don't even really try and square it up with who God is. And I believe this is why God 
was blessing and God was answering Habakkuk in here because he was both willing to ask the hard questions and also be willing to wait and know that God would answer those questions eventually. That should be our heart attitude when we face difficult things. Interact, let, let those things be things that we think of in light of who God is and then let him sort out those things and show us more about him when we don't get it. Do you want to be a prayer warrior like Habakkuk? Be willing to come to him with those hard questions. The ones that cause that anxiety in your heart, those circles of fear and of worry, be willing to take those to the Lord and let him work those things out. Looking at him, looking at who he is, and just taking him to him and saying, this is who you are. I don't get how it works together, but I'm going to trust you. That's how we need to approach those things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for this prophet in the Old Testament, someone who we know very little.